Welcome to season 12 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week, Coach J.Y. Obona rejoins the podcast and comes to talk to us about all different areas of junior tennis development. I I don't even know how I'm going to come up with a title for this one because I feel like we just covered so many topics in our conversation. I'm really, really excited for you guys to hear from JY and what he's up to and how he approaches junior tennis development, which in my opinion is a very unique um, approach to working with kids and working with the families of the kids to make sure that everybody's getting what they need out of this junior tennis journey. So before I bring JY on, a quick reminder, if you haven't already, we would love for you to become a member of ParentingAces.com. Just go to our website, click on the join button. You can become a free member, an annual member, a monthly member, whatever suits your needs. If you become an annual member, though, it also includes two complimentary consults with me, and we can discuss anything that is on your mind about your family's tennis journey. So take a look at that and now sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Coach J.Y. Obona. J.Y., welcome back. It's been a little bit since we've had you on the podcast. I think toward the beginning of the season, actually, and now we're toward the end of the season. Um, Great to see you. Cannot wait to hear what you're up to. But before we jump into that, our audience knows you recently became a dad and want to hear how that's going for you. Uh, Well, thanks for having me on and thanks for giving me a chance to to talk about my son that because you want to talk about a life changing experience. In, in so many different ways, but I think what's great is I can finally at least now talk from the perspective of a parent. I can see like what parents go through, which I think is only going to help me help other parents, at least in specific to tennis. But I mean, what an incredible journey it's been almost two years and just the change and everything, the life and watching them grow up. I mean, it's, it really is the greatest thing, you know, I've ever just been a part of. And uh, it's the biggest responsibility, but I mean, it's the best responsibility and yeah, it's been great. I mean, I love it. hardest thing I've ever done in my life, like by <laughs> far, like there's nothing. I know like tennis and tournaments and nerves and pressure and presenting and caught, traveling. This is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But I, I'll never forget what my assistant coach at, at Florida State once said, you know, like usually the, the harder the things are or the more we don't want to do something, the better they are for us. You know, we you talk about how the salad dressing, you know, it's the most unhealthy part of the salad. I, remember, yeah. I still remember that. that was my freshman year. And Nick was Nick Kroll was talking to me about that. And I just I mean, this is it. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's like the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Um, so it's been great. I love it. I love it. Well, we have lots to talk about today. You have been very prolific in your blog writing and in your social media posting, and you've been providing some really, really great content, um, thought-provoking content, and apparently content that is causing people to reach out to you and comment and ask further questions, dig deeper, which is always a great thing. And one of the topics that I want to touch on today is something that you've been writing about, and that's the mental side of the game. And the importance of the mental side and what the role of the tennis coach is in helping players develop that side of the game. After we talk about that, we're going to jump into some other topics as well, because like I said, you've been very prolific and I want to, I want to pick your brain a little bit, but, but let's start there. What are you hearing from the players you're working with and from their parents about some of the gaps in training along the mental side of tennis? Well, it's definitely the, it's the hardest part to work on. Um, I think it's the most frustrating part to work on because, you know, you want to go fix a forehand. It's a little bit easy to see where you need to fix it, what you need to do. Like technique to me is easier to fix. Uh, it's, there's a visual aspect to it and it, it's kind of pretty clear cut, especially if you put on video, you want to go that far. It really makes it a lot easier. The mental side is so tough because everybody's a little bit different. Everybody has different experiences everybody handles the same experience differently. 
And then we have home environments that affect how like kids behave on tennis courts and stuff. And everyone has a different home environment. And the, 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 the tough part is it is the most important thing in regards to being a successful, I'll just, I'll stick to tennis. You can easily make an argument. It's for every sport, anything we do in life, whoever can handle things mentally well, you're going to do good. But at least in tennis, I say this a lot, you know, you can have the most beautiful technique in the world. If you can't perform under stress, pressure, and nerves, doesn't matter. You can't, you can't execute that perfect technique because your body's going to freeze. So it, it's the most, impo- that's the most common question I get. How do I play well under pressure? And how do I do well, like when I'm nervous? And it's not an easy answer for me because also I need to get to know the person. I need to know why they're feeling the way they are. Where does it come from? Why are they thinking? Some people are afraid to lose. Some people are afraid to win. Some people have so much pressure to win. Some people don't care enough. Uh, some, for some, they, they don't work hard enough in practice to where they don't have good habits in matches. But I, I won't see that in one conversation or even two. I need to see that a lot. Um, so, yeah, it's tough, but it's the most important thing I, I try to help people with. And when you say you try to help them, how can a coach help a player overcome some of these blocks that they have to achieving their highest potential? The first thing I try to identify is like, okay, what's the easiest and most simple stuff I can help someone get better at? And that's usually strategy and technique. Is there something technical that's holding them back? Because if your technique is that bad, or it's bad, you know, let's try to get it better because you have a better chance of putting the ball in play. Uh, The next part will be strategy. Do you have any idea what you're doing on the court? Do you, are you setting up your strengths and hiding your weaknesses or are you just reacting to everything? Are you recognizing patterns and putting yourself in good positions and points? Those two things are the easiest, but some of the things that aren't coached because the technical side is coached, but the strategy side of it um, is not coached because we've, said this before on another podcast, most coaches don't watch their kids play, you know, competition. So they don't see where those things happen. Uh, And then if if those, if the fixes we make there still have issues like with them executing under pressure, you know, they're, the techniques gotten better. Uh, They're not making bad decisions anymore. They're just hitting to the right spot of the court, but they keep missing anyway. That's when I have to now dig deeper. So but I try to not dig deeper because I don't want, let me rephrase that. I try to not dig deeper right away because why do I want to get into somebody's heart and soul and deeper issues in life too quick when if they just hit the ball across court more than they hit it down the line, everything's fine. And we don't actually don't need to go like to like, Hey, well, what's going on here? Why do you think? Cause if we make an athlete think too much. They're also done. They mm-hmm. can't, they, they can't perform. I was listening to a great video, which I'm definitely going to turn into a social media post. Justin Fields, the quarterback of the Chicago Bears, talking about how he's thinking too much, right? So I, I really want to be careful with that. How can I make simple and easy fixes without making them think too much? But some players, it, it's not enough, and I need to dig a little deeper. And then that's really where the conversations start. Um, all right, let me watch your practice. You know, um, I know I do, do a lot of online work, but kids have been coming to see me and get some work in on the courts. I'm like, okay, let's go play a practice match. Let's talk things out. Let me see what you're seeing. And that's where I get to see some habits. And some kids work really hard and they do everything right in practice and they have a great attitude. So I'm like, okay, so it's deeper than just practice habits now. Now I need to go one step further. Okay, what's your grow, What's your life thing like growing up? You know, What's your environment? Are you comparing yourself to people? What are your expectations? And as you can see, like all these things I need to look at to really get to the core of like why someone can or cannot perform well under pressure, it does not happen overnight or even over one week. It takes a long time. Now, sometimes we get the answer quicker, but that's mostly a little bit by luck than it is like I have this great picture perfect process that if everybody follows, because everybody's a little different. So I don't know where to start. I have my go-tos. And then it's from there, it's just, re, you know, reacting to the situation, seeing what's working and see what I think might go best after that. How does fitness come into play with all of this? Because you didn't mention that yet. I probably should have. Okay, so that's great. You know, I mean, if you're 
See, this is why we all, I always talk about working better as a team because yeah. we forget stuff. So thank you for bringing that up because that should probably go in line with, uh, you know, your practice habits good or your strategies correct. Because I was talking about this with, to a player, uh, I think a week or two ago. And I said, look, you play two matches a day, right? So, but you only play tennis an hour and a half, two hours a day, but then you go play a tournament and you're playing four to five hours a day and you're signing up for doubles at every opportunity. Now, once in your life, have you ever practiced even more than two and a half hours a day? So in order to be able to play that much tennis that long and on back-to-back -back days, right. we need to start replicating that work somewhere. You know, this is where we can ask questions about homeschooling and stuff, but that's a whole big topic, right? But your fitness has to be on par with the level that you're playing at and trying to get to as well. So maybe you can hit three good open stance backhands on the run, but can you do 60? Because you might need to do that in one day and recover and do it the next day. You know, are you spending enough time in the gym to where your body doesn't break down and that's why you're missing? You, ha you have good intentions. You have good technique. I saw this with, with a, a younger player I was working with. I've, you know, I got on the court with them in person. I'm like, you know, I just don't think they're strong enough to actually handle that ball consistently. It's not that they're not trying to do it the right way. I just don't think they can. Yeah. So actually, I'm not your answer right now in regards to that shot. I, we need to call a strength and conditioning coach. We need to get your, your fitness program. We need to hit that area. So, yeah, those three areas are probably what I would hit before I go deep into their soul. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you go deep into their soul, too, because <laughs> yeah. that to me is the sign of a coach who cares, right? It's not just about hitting forehands and backhands. It's not just about footwork. It's not just about, you know, being in the gym, but it's also who are you as a person? I care about you. I'm your coach. I'm here to see you and help you develop your whole person, not just you as a tennis player. And this is why I keep having you on, JY. This is what sets you apart as a coach because you you do show your players that you care about more than just what they're doing on court. And I, I love that about you. Um, so with this mental stuff, is there a time where you feel like it as the tennis coach, you are kind of at your limit and maybe it's time to bring in a sports psychologist or, you know, somebody who's more specialized on the mental side, or do you feel like as the tennis coach, this is in your wheelhouse to take it, you know, as far as you need to take it. I'll go even one step further. I've recommended myself that I should be fired if things didn't get better. Right. Not for lack of caring or trying. It's just sometimes co a coach and a player don't connect. So it's just, it, there's a, we just get a bet. We get along better with some people than we do with others. That's just the way it is. So uh, yeah, I mean, you, you try to bring in other people and sometimes that other person might be yourself as a coach. There's nothing wrong with that. So, and some people won't open up to me as much on the court. Um, I'll see that something is going on and they just won't give me more detail. It'll show up in how they play. I'll try to slowly ask them questions. But I think also to gain that trust for them to open up and for them to even be able to communicate what they're thinking, it's very hard for me uh, to do with like a 12 or 13 year old child. They don't know how to talk. They don't know how to communicate yet. That's just life. Um, you know, and that's where also for me to get to that point, I would actually probably have to talk so much more in the practice where it's more of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So at that point, which is necessary, but now I'm not also teaching tennis either. So if it gets to the point where I'm like, okay, it's taking me too long to break through. I'm spending too much time here. Your child's supposed to be learning the game of tennis. I know the mental side is part of it as well, but I'm spending so much time just talking that I'm not even teaching them anything at all. So it's like, okay, let's bring in a, a, a psychologist, somebody else where maybe it's away from here. So yes, I'll still work on that side myself, but they do need to hit some balls and run as well and get a feel for that stuff. And let's get a psychologist who there's a reason why they're psychologists. They're trained in this. So as much as I consider, you know, I think tennis coaches need to have some sort of psychology experience and knowledge, uh, maybe even certifications at times, the real sports psychologists, they, they can, they kind of know how to hit the bones, right? I forget yeah. that phrase, but they, 
They know how to dig in well with leading questions that are very good. They know how to read the situation with the person better. It just feels like a safer environment in a closed room. Parents aren't listening. No one's there to judge. And that's where the player can open up to them. Mm -hmm. Now, I've also seen this before, myself included, like a psychologist only works as well as that player is willing to open up, you know? True, true. And so if that player is still not willing to open up and really be honest and just allow themselves to, uh, gosh, what's the, uh, Brene Brown had a, had a great book. Uh, I don't know if you know who she is, a psychologist. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, if, if Big she, fan. Being, being, you know, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, right? You know, if you're not allowing yourself to be vulnerable, either to your coach or to your psychologist or to your parents, no one can help you. Yeah. And so, but psychologists, kind of know how to lead you down that road probably better than most tennis coaches true 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 yeah and it it's um it's really important and and you know as tennis coaches I think it's important to recognize when you are at the limits of of what you can do with a player and talking with the parents and making those recommendations so that you're continuing to push forward in the process that you know, the kids don't get bogged down or caught in like this plateau phase for too long. So um, I always am appreciative when coaches are willing to refer kids to other people to help complete the package and and get the player to their highest potential. I think it's really important um, for you as a coach to have a network of professionals that you feel comfortable referring people to, but also that you have, as you said, you know, this base knowledge that you can work up to a certain point and then maybe it's time for the professional to step in. Um, but, yeah. yeah, we all have our own expertises. Um, I, there are certain parts, even within tennis, that if another coach came in in that area and talked more about that, they're going to teach me. And I'm mm-hmm. going to be like, oh, wow, yeah, I've never really thought about things that way. And I have my things that I'm better at. Like, we can't all be perfect. Not all tennis coaches are experts in the same exact thing. So just a month ago, or one of the players I was working with, you know, he, he started with a new coach doing some private lessons because, you know, I don't work with kids every week. And, uh, and that new coach said something. I've been trying to say the same thing for two years. That coach, one time on the court, said it in a language, in a way that the kid responded, fixed forever. And I'm like wow. – you know that but that's why it's like trying to figure out the language of the player and what they understand and what resonates that's that's not easy and sometimes you go to another coach first try I'm like oh my gosh but I was like thank you I said thank you to the coach this has been a frustrating part for me and that was really awesome and and that's why it's good to bring in outside people and just hey you know can you help me with this yeah I love that you talked about private lessons. This is the perfect segue into what we want to dig into next, JY, which is how should a player's practice time be structured? And by that, I mean, how many private lessons, how many group lessons, how many practice matches should a player incorporate into their weekly or monthly schedule in order to help them continue to get better? Um, and I know it's it, not the same for everybody. Okay, but, good. Yes. That, that's a, that's where I was going to start. I'm like, yeah. But I would say the younger you are, you know, the the more private lessons you're going to want. Um, Why? Without ever, well, the the younger you are, and when I talk young, I'm like under 13. You okay. know, under 12. I'm talking about your your anything under that really. You because technique is so hard to improve once they're over 13, 14. They've either played too much tennis or they're too, they've started to become more aware of what they're good and what they're not good at. They're more sensitive to things when they start to fail. And when they do that, it's harder to change. It's too emotional for them. When you're young, every, you're, you could hit a ball over the fence. You think it's the greatest thing in the entire world. So for you to work through technical changes at that age, it's much easier because okay. they're not so focused on winning now. Um, so you want to get that technical base as young as possible. Now, when I say spend more time doing private lessons. I'm not saying exclude groups, exclude match play, but you know, maybe when you're 16, you might be doing one or two private lessons a week. Maybe you're doing four or five when you're nine and 10, 
I'm not saying a full hour, but even if it's 15, 20 minutes, just working on that one stroke and then go do an hour and a half of group stuff, right? You know, as much as you can get when you're younger, then the better you get, you start to tilt it a little bit more towards match play, group play. And those private lessons start to become more of like, let's just make sure everything is staying steady and you just work on finer detail. So let me just kind of recap what you just said, because I think this is really important. So at the early stages of tennis development and really, you know, you're, we're assuming here that a, a child is starting at age six, seven, eight to play the game, right? Um, yeah. We're not talking about somebody that's stepping on the court for the first time at 12, 13. Yeah. So for these younger children, that one-on-one -on -one time with a coach to develop proper technique is really important, but that still needs to be in, done in combination with group drills so that they're playing points, they're seeing different features of the court, they're learning about the physics of the court, the geometry of the court, all of that. Um, as they get older into their teen years, maybe one or two private lessons a week and then more drills and match play so that they can really start to hone those skills. But when you say private lesson, one thing that jumped out at me is you said it doesn't necessarily mean a full hour. Yeah. So, Cause everybody loves to do that one hour thing. It's like, well, and it, it's, it, it, you know, super expensive. Yeah. Like not everybody can afford to do that. Right. I mean, so, in, in, in reality, you know, it, the dream scenario would be that you're part of such a small group setting with coaches that care that they help you with your private lessons as well, right? That's something I've recommended to everybody. I've, for me, I've realized it's not good for me to do a private lesson with somebody if I'm if they're not also in a group with me, mm -hmm. because I either have to work with those coaches as well, because those coaches need to reinforce the technique. I mean, the dream scenario is those technical changes and improvements are being reinforced in the group play. And hopefully that group is small enough to where they can remind you, Hey, you're supposed to be working on this. Hey, that form, that's kind of the hard part. Some groups get too big or they don't have a good uh, player to coach ratio and they just can't, they can't coach technique. They're too busy babysitting, right? Just getting things organized as far as like, Hey, stand here because you should be doing this. Hey, stop hitting the ball on the fence. Right. So, I mean, the dream scenario really is that you don't have to be signing up for private lessons. I mean, you know, when I was like 15, 16, you know, or even 14, look, I don't even know why I'm saying that. I'm going my whole life. My dad, you know, he, he was my coach, but he also ran my groups. You know, my dad played pro. So the person I was doing private lessons with, my dad was reinforcing the stuff I was doing in groups. But also, even when I wasn't like doing a private lesson, like it's, it's interesting, this private lesson stuff. For me, I did so few private lessons actually growing up. That was more of like, I didn't have anybody to play with. But in the group, I was being coached to what to do. We would go serve. Maybe I'd stay 15, 20, 30 extra minutes, you know, but it's not like I ever didn't go to a group clinic in the afternoon because I was doing a private instead which I think is a bit very common thing where it's like you only do two or three group I was playing five groups a week Monday to Friday and if I wanted some extra time I would come before or after but I would and even when I was 16 17 and I was you know now you know one of the best players in the country I was getting coach technique and stuff during that practice I didn't need to say hey Hey, do you have like an extra hour later and be like, oh, okay, let me check my schedule. No, like I was during that group clinic, I was coached everything, you know, so because groups were small. I mean, it's so, I mean, in your opinion, is the ideal group size four kids, six kids? Is there an ideal group size or does it depend on the level of the play? Depends on the level of play. I would say never more than four. I know that's not ideal, but he, Here's where I'll go. Full dream scenario is four, four kids, two courts. Mm. You know, we were talking about this before, how well now pickleball can have 16 people on one court, right? Like yeah. I get the financials. Like I know it doesn't work. I know like <laughs> two kids on one court spread out over two courts and, and all that. Like it, it's not going to work. It's not going to make money for the club. I get it. Find a, figure it out. I don't know. But ideally you want four kids so you can interchange them. They get mm -hmm. to make friends as well. 
but you can also do full court drills and the coach can still coach everybody. So, yeah. you know, that's the, the best scenario. If you can at least get on one court, fine, but yeah. no more than four, please. Yeah. Yeah. And we were also talking about the importance of match play and integrating match play into weekly practices this has been a hot topic for years for me. I talk about it a lot on this podcast because I still feel like most kids are missing that component to their tennis development. What are you starting to see, JY? Is it getting better? Are kids going back to organizing practice matches or are we still in the same kind of stalemate situation where we just can't get these kids out to just play a freaking tennis match yeah i think it's uh we can uh, we can use the word embarrassing for for what <laughs> and i say embarrassing because it's up to us coaches to educate the parents uh whether we provide that environment or not to let them know if your kid is going to play competitive you know tournaments and has a desire to at, at any level they need practice matches because how can you be good at something you never practiced. Okay. Tennis matches are not feeding drills. You have to run all over the court, make strategic decisions, a ball here, a forehand short court is not the same technique as a forehand three feet behind the baseline. Right. And you need to read and react and do all that stuff, but you can't practice that. You know, you can't become good at that. If you don't practice that, the problem is doing matches, you know, isn't financially rewarding for clubs. So they just, aren't informing parents of that they need to do practice matches. Um, so they won't have the court space at clubs for parents to just get a friend and say, Hey, let's play a practice match. They, they won't have course. So I have to play at eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't help the situation for those that do want to play practice matches anyway. Um, others club. But there will... are public courts. I mean, pretty much every town has at least one park with public tennis courts where you can go play and either it's free or it's a couple bucks. I mean. Well, and that's that, you know, and that's the other part of it, right? I think the, the inconvenience of having to find somewhere to play a practice match sometimes isn't, you know, the, they love everything to just be done for them. They drop the kid off and then that's it. So look, I, I get it. I have a, I have a child now. Like I don't want to be, I get it. I, I get it. Um, but you know, we're just trying to help you with what your, your child's dreams are and, and all of that. But I think the other part too, with that is they're, they're also not being formed informed that practice matches should be part of their weekly training structure. So, because if the coaches start to inform them of that, then the next question would be, why are you not providing that for us? Then? Right. Right. So that's, you know, academies aren't going to want that question back, but let's just say they do. Okay, let's go. This is going to be the final part where let's just say we, because there are some good academies that they really try everything, even if they can't provide it. We know there are some good ones informing parents of everything they need to do. Um, you know, a lot of kids won't play practice matches because they have to find the UTR that's exactly their level or better. They will never play with anybody that's a little bit lower than them for too many sensitive reasons. They can only play with their two, three friends. They won't want to practice with somebody that they don't like. Yeah. Right. So they also limit their pool of who to even ask. Right. And I think we're also in a, in a generation where we're, I think parents are almost a little too hands on with certain things and kids just kind of are expected to have their lives organized where it's like, hey, go ask a friend to play a practice match. Mom and dad shouldn't have to do this all the time, all right? I, I, this one I've never understood when kids, you know, they only go to tennis two, three days a week for that group clinic, right? Maybe one yeah. private, so they have like two extra days. And like, yeah, I just can't find a practice match. I'm like, how many kids are in your group? You can't, you want to tell me you can't, not one of them will play with you. Right. Go, go three courts down to the next group, ask them. They, they can't find anybody. I'm like, are you, you're joking me. I don't think they're really asked. Yeah. You know, because if you're part of a group clinic and you can't find somebody to play with, I don't know how hard you're asking, you know? And yeah. so, and I don't know how many kids you're asking. 
And if you're asking everybody in the whole world, maybe, you know, I don't know, you pay them 10 bucks. I don't know, buy them a McDonald's happy meal, but it's got to be part of the training structure. It, it really has to be because as I said, you, you can't get good at what you don't practice. Right. So JY, I mean, as a coach, what do you tell the kids you work with about, you know, how many matches a week they should be playing and what do you, how do you educate the parents of these kids? Because I've been trying to do it for years and I, I'm obviously, you know, some people are listening, but we still have a long way to go with this. Yeah. One, I think what's also hard is trying to set up a schedule that actually works, not just for the player, but the family driving them around. And that's not easy, especially when one yeah. place isn't providing you everything. I think that's probably the hard part every parent's trying to figure out. I think I think if you tell a parent and a child you need practice matches, they'll want to do it, but they'll be like, but I'm required to go to drill three days a week. You know, now I only have Monday, and but that's my private lesson day, and then Friday I go to a tournament. So and, and that now it becomes hard to try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So but I say, look, I you you need at least one practice match a week. If you can at least get two, if you can get two days, oh my gosh, you're you're doing great. If you can at least get a set on two separate days, at yeah. least that, you're doing great. What I've also tried to recommend to people is, if you're doing a private lesson, make that your practice match. And what Meaning? I tell them to do, ask another kid to join that practice, mm -hmm. and it's a scheduled practice match with a coach. Ah. You know, getting you a coach max, a coach match play. Mm -hmm. So. Because what, what a lot of kids struggle with is getting feedback on strategy and everything because they don't play sure. enough full core points. So I said a great workaround is that is tell your your the coach who does your private lessons, hey, I want you to coach me through a practice match. Find another kid. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't find anybody. Can you please find someone? So that's a great way because people are going to respond more to a coach asking for a private lesson than probably yeah. like another. Uh, sorry, asking a coach asking for a practice match to right. somebody to come in than another kid or parent. So I think that's one workaround that I try to tell people, don't worry so much, especially if their technique is good enough. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be, I'm like, you got solid technique. Hey, you got a tournament this week. You don't have another day where you can play a practice match. Make that private lesson your practice match. If you still can't find anybody, play with a coach. You know, it's not the same. It's still better than nothing. Right. You know, you got to get some full court movement in for a full hour, hour and a half and, you know, play a practice match. So, and then, you know, that's where I'll say, so one to two practice matches, one private lesson or two, and then just the rest groups. That, that's it. what I recommend. And I'm like, and you need fitness three days a week. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a big commitment. And I get that not everybody has the flexibility to make that work, but there are workarounds, as you said. I love the idea of turning the private lesson into the practice match. And I can tell you just from my kid's experience when he was in juniors, he used to play practice matches with a coach and coaches are great practice match partners because they can make your kids so uncomfortable on the court and force your kid to learn how to respond to that discomfort in a way that a friend just isn't able to do. And I think there's a lot of value in that as well. Yeah. And what you mentioned there, I think I, I'd love to follow up on where you said about, you know, how much time everything takes. And it's like, what I try to do with everybody is help them with their time management. All right, this is everything you need. How are we going to fit this in? So mm -hmm. I was going through the other day with somebody who, they're not that strong physically. I said, well, you can make your warm up your fitness session. So, it, you know, if you're not a very strong person, like fit your weights on your back and all that, then you can do body weight exercises as part of your warm up. And so now you're warming up for your tennis game. It's 10, 15 minutes, but you did 40 squats, 20 side lunges on each leg, 15 push ups, you know, found a bar, you did 10 pull ups, and you just got a little stronger. And now you just warmed up. So, that, that can be a workaround for something you're doing, right? I think it's just trying to just, – just got to be smart with it. A lot of times they think, well, now I need an hour and a half at this gym session. It's like, no, you, you don't need that much. You need this stuff. But tell me all the time you got, and then let's see what we can figure out. You can't do a full practice match for two and a half hours. Can you give me an hour? Yeah. Okay, let's do an hour. It's better than nothing and just doing group drills all day long where 
four to six on a core and you never get full core points. One of the things that I learned from Frank Gianpaolo, and I don't know if you've read his book. Oh, I read his book. Yeah. I read his book. Yeah. So one of the things that he has kids do when he first starts working with them is to write down all the things that they have in a day and how much time everything takes. So for example, you know, what time do you wake up? How much time do you need for breakfast, getting dressed, going to school, um, having a snack after school, getting to practice? How much time do you need for homework? How many hours a night are you sleeping? Um, you know, how do we squeeze family time in? And then work backwards from that to figure out where the tennis fits in, you know, and yep. what are things you can cut out? Where are things where you can find little pockets, like you said, even if you have 15 minutes, that's enough time for a workout. That's enough time for a mental training or, you know, to sit and sorry, I'm losing my earpiece here um, to do a meditation, you know, to get yourself mentally ready for that next session. Um, you know, let's say you have 10 minutes in the morning between the time you're finished getting dressed and the time it, it takes to leave for school that's a great time to write down your goals for the day. And that's a valuable piece of your training. I mean, they're just, there is time there. We just forget to utilize it in the most efficient way possible. And believe me, I am a firm believer in downtime. I think our kids don't get enough downtime and downtime isn't playing video games. It's not being on social media. It's, you know, chilling with a good book, it's listening to music, it's playing an instrument, doing something that is satisfying and and really soul satisfying more than anything else. But video games and screen time do not fit into that. <laughs> well, I, I always try to schedule in, you know, full weekends off, you know, for everybody at least once a month, Saturday, mm -hmm. Sunday, no running, no tennis, anything. I do think that's – just get away from tennis. Don't think about it. Yeah. Um, do whatever you want and then just get back on Monday. I, I think that's very important. You know, I, I do – you know, when we talk about time management and stuff, uh, I want to bring up the example of somebody that I've been working with for the last two years because, you know, it's very important. How What do you want out of tennis, right? Yeah. How far, you know, how far do you want to go in tennis? This person wanted to become, they literally wanted to become the best tennis player they could be. And it's not just because they said it, because I hear that from every single person that shows yeah. up. I want to be the best I can be. Okay, great. Show me. Right. This kid showed but, me. But let me interrupt you one second, JY, because this is another thing that, that I really try to encourage families to do. And that is check in with the player periodically, just because they told you something when they were eight doesn't mean they still have that same goal when they're 13 yeah. and things change. Kids change, their interests change, families change. So, you know, it's important to, to revisit these goals that these kids set for themselves every three months, every six months, you know, I say more often than yearly, because I think, you know, kids are changing so much as, they go from age eight to 18 that you can't wait a whole year to revisit it. But anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you and get you off track, but I, I really do feel like that it's important that just because a kid says something at one age doesn't necessarily mean they're still committed to that same goal two years down the road. Oh, and you can even make the same argument for within the first month. Yeah. You know, I think, you can generally look at somebody and just start to see some signs that something is off, something is different, something is changing. We need to give them an opportunity to speak up by the way they go about things. Mm -hmm. You know, the parents do get to know their child pretty well. So they'll, they'll see like when they're unhappy on the court, when it looks like they're not giving their best effort at matches, when they're just getting upset too fast every day, where it's like something's not the same, you know, mm -hmm. passion wise, you know, they're not, they don't seem like they're having as much fun as like when they used to sure tennis can be frustrating, but they're like, no, this is different. You see signs like that. That's a time to, Hey, you know, what's going on? Get in. Cause a lot of kids will feel like they don't want to look like quitters and they don't mm -hmm. want to disappoint people. So they won't speak up and they need a safe space given to them by their parents to say, Hey, no, no, no. Just, sure. You want to go to practice tomorrow and uh, just give them an opportunity to revisit that. I, I think that's, that's great. You know, and you know, and that's where, uh, 
talk about showing something, right? I mean, th this kid that I was working with, so education was a big part of their, the family's goal and the kid's mm -hmm. goal. And mm -hmm. they were not going to go to homeschool. That was never even part of the discussion, but they still wanted to become as great a tennis player they could be in and uh, give them a chance at playing division one at a pretty high level. And I said, okay, well, you know, we've already laid out the things that I believe a player should be doing on a weekly basis uh, and daily as well and everything you need to do. And, you know, I found out a couple months down the road uh, that he was doing his fitness at 9.30 at night at home, hmm. 9.45 at night. He would go to practice. He would wake up at 5.30 a.m. as soon as the sun was up and schedule maybe a hit or a tennis lesson with somebody at 6.00. Uh, when going to bed at like 11, 30, 12. Now, look, I'm a huge believer in sleep. Please, like, don't get this wrong. Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. Please get that book. It's, it's unbelievable. But if you want to be the best you can be, and you really do, convenience is not something you're going to get when you're still trying to go to school. So it's very hard to fit this stuff in. And there's going to be times where, you just had too much homework after school. You had to stay late and do something. You cannot skip fitness. I'm sorry. You know, you cannot take the day off because you need to study more. Mm. It's like study ahead of time. You can't take today off. You have a tournament in two days. And so you start to organize your life well enough so that everything is prepared. You're studying ahead of time. You're getting ahead with your homework so that if a day comes, then you know, you're ready to just give it a little bit more time, maybe lose a little sleep because that's really the only way to be that good. It can be, it's not easy to just drop a kid off five minutes down the road. You have the best Academy that gives you everything you need, fitness there, nutrition there. And they, they, you, you're going to have to give up something somewhere. Yeah. Now, if you're not, I had, to, I said this to another parent, if you don't want to give it up, you want to make sure your child gets eight to 10 hours of sleep, uh, which we know is very important for teenagers and the growth of their brain. We know it's important. If, and you want great, great grades, great SAT score, and to get into a very good educational school. I think that's awesome. Don't expect to be the greatest tennis player ever. Go for it, but you, it, something's got to give, all right? Mm -hmm. If you're taking days off because you have to study, go for it. If that's what you go for it, but you, you can't expect to be at the same level as somebody who's not willing to give up that day of practice, practice up is fine with an A minus or B plus so long as their tennis improves. Yeah. So know where you are, know what you want and understand like we we're talking about with Frank and putting that time list together. What is the most important thing for you? And then work backwards and be like, is that enough for you? And then set reasonable expectations. Well, and, and I think that's the key, right? Reasonable expectations. And I think that's where a lot of us fail is we think we can do it all. We think our kids can do it all. And we just are setting ourselves up for failure, period. And I mean, you're finding this now that you're a parent too, you know, finding that quality time to spend with your child while also building your coaching and also preserving your marriage and making sure it's intact and and all of these different things that we all as human beings have to do throughout our days and weeks you can't be the best at everything all the time something's going to have to take a back seat periodically and i think teaching our kids how to balance those things is a great gift to give them and i think that's yet one more thing that playing high level sports offers to our children is it gives them the opportunity to learn these lessons at from a very young age. Yeah. And, and let's give parents a nod here too. I mean, you know, if you're a parent of somebody trying to achieve great things in any sport, they're sacrificing things from their personal time for their child. You know, Absolutely. you have to, you have to give up things to take your child places, practice games, you know, shopping for their new gear that's worn out, they need new stuff, thinking ahead, planning travel, you know, so it's not just the kids that have to give up stuff here too, it's the parents as well, like they have to give up their own personal stuff too. You know, we all want our cake and they eat it too, but gotta, gotta share a few pieces. Yeah, absolutely. JY, uh, it's always so fun to talk to you. <laughs> I love it. Um, for the parents that aren't subscribed to your blog yet, how do they get subscribed? How do they follow you and all that stuff? 
I'm everywhere on social media, Abona Tennis. Uh, you can also go to just directly my website, you know, abonatennis.com, A-U-B-O-N-E, tennis.com. And, you know, I'm there. It, it's pretty hard to not reach me, you know. So <laughs> just re- reach out to me at any time. I try to help in any way I can uh, within the time that I got, of course. And, yeah, just, you know, I'm trying to do better also at putting out more information as well, you know, but time management. <laughs> so, yeah. It's always a challenge, but you're doing a yeah. fantastic job. And I always get excited to see your posts because there's always a pearl or two of wisdom in there that uh, we can all use. And um, thank you for taking the time to do that. I love talking with you. I, I still say one of these days that I'm in Atlanta, I'm going to come have a lesson with you and we're going to yeah. be on court together and meet in person and and get to hang for a little bit because i I feel like we have a friendship over podcasting, but um, I do look forward to seeing you and meeting that little boy before he's in kindergarten. Um, Hopefully that'll happen one of these days. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And maybe, who knows, maybe I'll even see uh, Indian Wells next year over in California. So hopefully we can make that happen. That'd be great. Thanks again for coming on. And to my audience, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.